Welcome to this forum for candidates for Oregon House of Representatives District 16 race. This online program is co-hosted by the Lynn Benton branch of the NAACP, as well as the League of Women Voters of Corvallis. My name is Jessica McDonald, and I serve as the chair of the League of Women Voter of Corvallis's Voter Education Committee. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan education an advocacy organization working to defend our democracy and engage our community on the issues that matter most to them. I am joined by our co-moderator for this forum, Greg Corper, with the Lynn Benton branch of the NAACP's Political Action Committee. Greg, I will hand it over to you. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, I'm Greg Corper and I serve as the chair of the Political Action Committee of the Lynn Benton NAACP. Our organization's been active in the community since 1971. Our members are of diverse racial and ethnic backgrounds, working as advocates united in the fight to end racial inequality for all Americans. A nonpartisan organization, we are proud to co-sponsor this event to better inform Oregon voters of the key issues of the 2024 general election. And we want to convey our thanks to the candidates participating tonight in this forum and to all candidates who serve the values and ideals of American democracy. Thank you, Jessica. Well, welcome uh, tonight then to Sarah Finger McDonald and Mike Bilstein. Uh, to this candidates forum and to open the discussion um, what we're going to do here well let me say as background uh, uh, Sarah and Mike are candidates for the Oregon House of Representatives District 16 position and um, we've invited them here tonight um, to um, discuss their positions on the issues uh, of this election we are going to ask a series of questions and we're going to let each candidate take up to two minutes to uh, answer those questions. But first we're going to do two minute introductions. And um, so, um, and of course, um, uh, yeah, okay. So um, we're going to start with Mike. So Mike, please take a couple of minutes now to introduce yourself to our audience. I, uh, I'm happy to be here with you and happy to be hosted by League of Women Voters and NAACP, which both of which I'm a member. Um, so I'm hosting myself, I guess. Uh, I've, uh, I've been active in uh, public affairs over the last 25 years in Corvallis, and so a lot of people know me. Uh, I've been regularly a candidate in the Pacific Green Party for uh, office and besides serving 12 years on the city council. Um, and the reason I'm with the Green Party is because of the values that it represents. And those values are, are democracy, democratic participation, uh, ecological wisdom, nonviolence, and social justice. And if, if the Democratic or Republican Party was delivering on those, according to those values, I would be supporting those, those, one of those parties, but they're not. And that's why I'm with the Pacific Green Party. Uh, one of the big issues that they're not delivering on right now is is climate uh, change and the uh, you know the, I think the humanity is facing an existential crisis now. What we what we do today is going to affect the future of humanity over the next millennia, and so I you know I part of my activity has always been to get a greater. Uh, greater attention and, and, and more effective action on the issue of climate change. And that's what I hope to do in the legislature. So thank you. Greg, you're muted. Well, Mike, thank you. And thanks for correcting me. Uh, and uh, Sarah, your opening remarks, please. Yeah, hi, I am Sarah Finger McDonald, no relationship to Jessica. And I am a mom and a scientist and an activist. I got my start working in politics immediately after the Sandy Hook shooting. 
my child started asking me questions about what happened. And I realized all I could do was tell him that I would work hard to make things better. And I started organizing um, and ended up founding what became the Oregon chapter of Moms Demand Action. And I continue that work on gun violence prevention now. Um, I then just, one of the things that I learned working on, on legislation with Moms Demand Action and the Oregon Alliance for Gun Safety is how important it is to have really good people step up and run for office. And I ended up deciding to run for the school board where I served for seven years after experiencing how hard it was to get services for a child with learning differences. And I realized that if my child it came from a different family and had different parents who weren't as able to navigate the educational system, she might not have learned how to read. And so I ran for the school board largely because I wanted to make sure that every kid in her class would learn how to read. And yeah, I sort of have continued in my service to our community with this, this promise that I made with, to my son of, I will work hard to make things better. And I want to serve our community in the Oregon House to help our working families to make sure that we build a community that's affordable, where people are supported and have access to the health care they need and the education they need. Thank you, Sarah. We're now going to ask a series of questions uh, of our candidates. We're going to rotate the asking of questions, and uh, we will also uh, rotate uh, moderators for the uh, statement of the questions. Each candidate will be allowed a maximum of two minutes uh, to respond to these questions. Uh, Jessica, would you get us started, please? Happy to, thanks, Greg. And with this order, we'll start with Sarah and then go to Mike. So the question is, the legislature must consider a large number of demands when budgeting from K through 12 and higher education to homelessness and the need for housing to addressing behavioral health and public safety and the need to find funding sources for transportation needs as well as wildfire costs, just to name a few. What are your priorities for 2025? Again, we'll start with Sarah. Yeah, it's hard to pick because there's a lot we need to work on. You, know, As somebody who's served on a school board for seven years, I'm definitely you know, interested in working, continuing to work on education and how we fund our education system. But I'm also interested in working on higher ed. That's, I've worked for OSU. I've been at OSU for 24 years as either a graduate student or employee. And I feel like being an advocate for higher education, especially in our district, is really important, both to support our students and make sure that we're working to make higher education affordable and to support the research we need to address critical issues like climate change and our response to its effects, to bring in you know, exciting innovation with chips in the innovation center and you know, the robots that are being developed at OSU and the exciting research around things like agrovoltaics and alternative energy sources. So I plan to be a really strong advocate for higher ed and the potential it has for our state, both in educating our students and for making innovations and changes that we need. One of the major conversations that's going to happen in Salem this year will in 2025 will be around transportation. And I will work with other lawmakers in our region to make sure that the needs of this area of our state are addressed, that we, you know, prioritize things like reliable, accessible rail, um, you know, investments in pu public transportation, making sure that we have um, the pedestrian and active transportation are a major part of the um, transportation infrastructure conversation, and to make sure that we're addressing the needs of our businesses so that we can transfer products um, whether that's on barges or trains or trucks, that we have the ability to support our businesses um, with a really robust, strong education or transportation system. Thank you, Sarah. And same question on priorities for 2025 to you, Mike. Start with the question, which was how do you anticipate funding this? 
Am I coming through okay? I, I'm getting messages that my uh, my uh, no. okay. <laughs> Anyway, I, I think the United States has been on a tax holiday for the last several decades, and in Oregon especially with the passage in 1990 of, of ballot measure five and then later measure 50, these restricted the ability of local governments and local school districts to uh, collect the, the taxes they needed. And it put the burden of funding schools on, on the state budget, which it had not been a major part of the state budget in the past. And as a result, the, there was no new source of income for the state, and what what has happened is that school funding, you know, has has become has dominated the uh, the state budget because of because of Measure Five and Fifty. So I I think the uh, the important thing thing is to end this tax holiday. The Measure Five and Fifty should be overturned. This local local governments and school districts should be allowed to tax adequately to support the programs that they that the communities want to provide. And at the same time, uh, there needs to be some reform of the income tax in Oregon. That the uh, the limits of ten percent, uh, you know, is is too low. Uh, there should be a progressive tax. Uh, you know, maybe maybe taxes should be lower for for low income, but it should be progressive, and and we should and the state should be collecting more revenue, and with more revenue, then the state could provide those services which is which have disappeared. Uh, when I was a student at OSU, I graduated in 1973. Tuition was fifty dollars per term, and now it's many thousand dollars per term in state. Um, so it's, you know, this, this show, you know, at that time, the state was, was providing 85% of school funding for the higher education. Now it's down in the, you know, 10 or 12% of, of state funding for higher education. So that, you know, naturally we've seen a de degradation of services in the state. And this has been the result of, of the, the tax holiday, which the, the state has been on. And so I think reversing that, getting rid of the kicker raising raising the the uh, minimum income tax and getting rid of measure 5 and 50 are, are part of the solution. Thank you. Thank you candidates and I'll hand it back to Greg for the next question. Thank you. In a state and country that has become deeply divided along political party lines, how do you plan to build relationships and find common ground across the aisle with other political parties and individuals. We'll start with Mike. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, you know, I, I had 12 years experience on the Corvallis City Council. I was working with people who didn't always agree with me. And I think what the, uh, the binding factor that kept us working together is we needed to get the work done. And I think that's the attitude that state legislators need to have is that we're there to do a job and, and getting the job done is, is what's important. I, I think the, the political division is somewhat phony. Uh, you know, I, I don't see the Democrat and Republican parties as that different. They are both uh, delivering to the, the people who can, you know, are able to control them through financing. And that in, in the United States, that is the, uh, the fossil fuel industry, the, the war industry, and and high finance and uh, you know there's you know some examples that in Oregon the the you know we have become a natural resource colony where we're providing uh, lumber in which there's hardly any benefit to the state or to or to employment in the state so both you know so it's it's really Wall Street is what benefits from Oregon forestry it's not it's not for the benefit of the state it's it's for the benefit of of Wall Street. And so I think, uh, you know, this, this, well, there is, there's some, obviously some political differences between the Democrats and Republicans, but on the main issues, they have collaborated in making sure that, that the wealth is siphoned from people and from the environment uh, to, the, to the wealthy and the planet is suffering from it. Thank you. Thanks for that answer, Mike. Sarah? Yeah, so, um... I have a PhD in horticulture. And one of the things I'm really excited about and looking forward to is serving on the Ag Natural Resources Land Use and Water Committee. And that committee you know, works on issues that are things that are valued by people across Oregon. You know, 
we value our agriculture. We really value our natural resources. Water is something that we think about across the state. These are values we share. And you know, I'm interested in working on that committee, one, because it sort of gets me excited as a scientist for the things that I that I know about and I can bring to that committee. But it also excites me because I feel like that's a place where there's there's really strong shared values. And we may approach things differently, but we if we all can come to the table agreeing that yes, these things are important, that's where I wanna be able to build relationships and build understanding and work together. And then those relationships can be used you know, to work on other issues too. Um, so that's sort of you know, the piece that I feel like I can really bring um, to the House of Representatives in a way that I can serve to work across the aisle. Thank you, Sarah. Jessica will ask our next question. Great. Uh, so we will start with Sarah and then move to Mike for this question on healthcare. Healthcare is a big issue in our area, maybe everywhere. Recently, we have seen the purchase of the Corvallis Clinic by Optum. Do you think there should be limits on private equity purchasing of healthcare systems? We'll start with Sarah. Yes. <laughs> this is one that this is an issue that when I was knocking on doors during the primary it came up very often worries about access to health care and how that would be impacted by corporate purchases of of you know the Corvallis clinic Corvallis clinic and and other clinics across Oregon and there was actually a bill to address this in the 2024 session that um died in the Senate Rules Committee and um representative Ben Bowman was the person who headed that up. And I've talked to him about, you know, that that's a really important issue for our community and that I would like to be involved in that work and to know more. Um, it's a bill that would require offices, officers of a company that owns a medical clinic to be doctors. And it would work to keep decisions regarding the administration of a healthcare business separate from decisions regarding the delivery of healthcare. You know, access to healthcare is something I care deeply about. I've had a lot of expensive healthcare needs over the last few years as I as I battled cancer. It was the first question my son asked me when I was diagnosed was, can we afford your care? I will work in the house to make sure that we have an affordable healthcare system so that Oregonians don't have to you know, worry about losing their house when they're facing a health crisis. Thank you, Sarah. And same healthcare question to you, Mike. Yes, I certainly agree with the restrictions on private equity uh, investment corporations from controlling healthcare in the state. And uh, um, and I, I think that actually, uh, it was my understanding that the the uh, NBOM who purchased was actually restricted from purchasing the Corvallis Clinic, but it was allowed because of an emergency, a bankruptcy, which was cause and that bankruptcy was the result of, of financing done by another uh, a, a corresponding uh, equity investment firm. And besides and besides healthcare, we also have the issue of of homes being purchased by private equity in Corvallis and and you know to be used as rentals, which is more more productive or more uh, financially productive than um, than having them available as as homes to be purchased by families to live in, which is contributing to the housing crisis in Corvallis. So um, I think in in the long term, uh, you know, we need to establish a, a single payer uh, health care system in Oregon. And uh, the, uh, you know, there is, a, well, task force uh, completed its work with, with recommendations, which have then the last legislature created another task force, which is going to come to the Actually, in 2026, they will deliver uh, a uh, a recommendation on establishing it. I think there needs to be strong support in the legislature for this process of establishing a single payer system. And I think that's uh, you know I think that's the sort of thing that we will see people backing off as the insurance companies, the private uh, um, healthcare providers. They will they will oppose you know ultimately forming a single payer system and uh, if and and they've 
they've been successful in lobbying in the past with the legislature. So I think we need legislators who are committed to seeing that process go through and setting up a system that does provide health care for all in Oregon. Thank you. Thank you, candidates. And now back to you, Greg. This question, uh, Mike is going to speak first and then Sarah will follow. Natural resource agencies are funded at less than 3% of the state's general funds, yet they are responsible for protecting our clean air, land, and water. Will you advocate for increasing funding for natural resource agencies? If so, how? Mike, you're Thank first. Thank you. Um, I, as I said earlier, I, I think uh, you know Oregon has become a, 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 a natural resource colony. Our forests are being strip mined for the benefit of, of investors outside the state with very little benefit to either workers or or to the state government. And I, you know as far you know certainly we need greater funding for our natural resource agencies and that should come from a, an appropriate, for appropriate taxation and and unless unless the state is going to raise adequate funding to support uh, these agencies then then we're not we're we're going to continue to to fail so i'm you know i i certainly agree with greater funding for the natural resource agencies but uh, it's all dependent on the state having a commitment to actually collecting the taxes needed to provide services and as long as we're not doing that then we're not going to we're not going to uh we're not going to protect our environment or we're not going to protect our 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 forests we're we're going to continue to to see them eaten up by by the, pri the private private investors thank you mike uh sarah yeah so um i as i said earlier i would really like to serve on the agricultural land use natural resources and water committee and um as I've talked to people preparing to serve in Salem, I've heard the message about how difficult it is to do the critical work of protecting our resources um, without the staff necessary to do the work. Um, one of the really key roles of a lawmaker is, is oversight. And I will make sure we're providing that oversight so that we really understand where the holes in our system that we've set up to protect our resources are, and I will work to make sure that we have um, the ability to fill them. You know, yes, we need tax reform in Oregon. We have a regressive system, and we need to, to look at additional funding sources. And we need to, as we do that, be accountable for how we use that money and understand where it's needed and how it will best impact the state to do things like protect our natural resources um, and you know, fund these um, these offices that are really critical to maintaining the values of Oregonians. Thank you, Sarah. Jessica will ask the next question. Yes, and you know, we were just talking about property tax reform or tax reform. So why don't we just kind of dig in a little bit deeper into that question and we'll start with Sarah and then go to Mike. Do you support property tax reform that could help provide more funding for K through 12 schools and for cities and counties? Uh, what reforms do you think are necessary? And starting with Sarah. Yes, I support tax reform to help us fund our K through 12 schools. I've sat on the budget committee and on the school board for seven years and have seen the boom and bust cycles that result from Oregon's tax system and how difficult it is for schools to really plan and to see the impact of programs they implement because they can put something in place and then in the next by name that funding is gone. Um, and it's a really difficult way to run a school system. Our current property tax system is both inefficient and unpredictable. It creates inequalities between homeowners because we rely on the assessed value of properties instead of the real market value. And it creates inequalities between jurisdictions because of the difference in permanent tax rates and the effects of compression. And so solving this tax problem also needs to be done in a way that solves this inequity problem. 
Um, we need a, a, a system that's stable and equitable and adequate, but still allows the voters to have some control to adopt local options like we do in Corvallis. You're know, looking at things like um, using a tax system that's closer related, closely, more closely related to the assessed value and the local levies and the choices that local jurisdictions have made to tax themselves to support the programs they need may be important. But we also, as we make those decisions, need to make sure that as we do that, the tax burden doesn't fall on people with lower property values in an inequitable way. We need to make sure that this is a progressive tax system. Thank you, Sarah. And Mike, same question to you. Uh, thank you. As I mentioned already, I, I, I favor overturning or reversing uh, ballot measures 5 and 50 and lifting the the restrictions on property taxes for local governments and school districts. The uh, when I was on the city council every year, the you know we would or every every biennium we would come up with the uh, you know the lobbying uh, priorities for the League of Oregon Cities and and property tax reform was was always the you know the the, the primary issue because local governments are hurt by it, um, not just the school districts, but. Um, in in Corvallis, the uh, typical home uh, gets a forty percent discount on their on their property taxes uh, based on you know the the assessed value versus the real market value, and that and that's you know that that's really to the benefit of, of very large property owners. It's not it's you know I think a, a you know one of the protections could be a homestead exemption maybe the first hundred thousand dollars of of a property would not be taxed at all with no limitations on you know no state limitations on what the tax could be on on the the remainder of the of the value um so you know this but the and i guess another property tax issue is the creation of special economic districts we have one in corvallis and which I regrettably voted for the city council was responsible for implementing it and it was unanimous in the city council when we did it. And I, I was kind of won over by the idea that this would be a, a uh, sustainability district where we would have sustainable industries. And so one of the sustainable industries that was, is benefiting from that is uh, new scale, the uh, small nuclear reactor uh, company which is you know so it, it, it's basically allowing the special economic districts that, that that get property tax exemptions is just part of the race to the bottom of lower taxes in order to attack attract the smokestacks thanks thank you candidates and back to greg for the next question yes um sarah and mike and mike's going to go first on this question uh, please tell us how you have supported women of color and other marginalized people through your policies and advocacy. Mike, you'll take this first, please. Uh, thank you. Um, well, I have a record of, of working on um, on issues that affect women of color, people of color, and and other disadvantaged peoples. I was I was a member of the. Uh, OSU President's Commission on the Status of Women, and while I was on on the commission, we we did a study of of the tenure of 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 uh, women of color in the university. You know why? You know how long they stayed, why they left, and what the university could do to retain them. So I, you know, I've I've had some experience with that. I also was the secretary of the Corporalist branch of NAACP for 15 years. And uh, you know, and working on on issues of people of color uh, through that, um, I th you know the the basic issue of of supporting uh, people in the state is to provide better quality services. And I think you know in the you know city government and and in state government and county and the school districts, having adequate funding is the primary issue, you know, and if, if we have primary, if we have the adequate funding, we can provide those services that will benefit women of color and other disadvantaged people in our community. Thank you very much, Mike. Sarah? 
Yeah. So I started, as I said earlier, my my work in politics, working in gun violence prevention and got into that work because of the shock of a mass shooting. But as I did research on issues around gun violence and gun tragedies, it became very clear that while those mass shootings make the news, what we were really experiencing was a slow motion massacre that happened every day in our country and was disproportionately impacting communities of color and women of color were at risk. And so I sort of changed what I was most interested in working on around that issue to make sure that we, we while we were passing laws, we weren't, weren't so focused on the big news making mass shootings, but that we were really working on protecting communities and protecting vulnerable populations. And that included things like suicide prevention and supporting violence and eruption. And so that you know, became a part of that work for me that was really key and important. I also, on the school board, have helped write and adopt our school policies that protect gender diverse students. And was there when we were adopting first, what was our equity policy, and then we revised it to become a, ra a racial equity policy to really make sure that we were upfront about what equity was and who we needed to be stepping up and supporting in our school district. And you know, there were other policies like working on our dress code policy, which was actually a really great experience because it was work that we did writing a policy with students and making sure that we had a dress code policy that was no longer just tragically gendered, that all students had a policy that worked for them. Um, I was also chair of the board when we worked on our last round of um, setting goals. And we had district-wide meetings to bring the community in um, to talk about what was going well and not well. And the most important part of that work was the meetings that we intentionally invited populations and families and community members who wouldn't have come to those broad meetings, but whose voices were essential for us to hear. So that as we were setting goals, those voices and those people had real input into that work. And so I, you know, that's something I want to continue doing is really being intentional about who I listen to and who I invite to give their input. Sarah, Mike, thank you very much for addressing that question. Jessica will ask our final question. Yes, thank you. So measure 110 is a hot topic in Oregon. What is your assessment of what worked and what did not work with measure 110? And what do you think is most important in monitoring the legislature's recent revisions? So we'll start with Sarah and then move to Mike. Yeah, I mean, we know from the war on drugs that we can't incarcerate our way out of a drug crisis. And we saw with Measure 110 that without real access to addiction services, decriminalization didn't work. And then we added on top of that, the perfect storm of a pandemic, the arrival of fentanyl, and just the time it took to stand up the resources that it really needed to get people help. Um, people with the difficult, with difficult getting services were often the people on Medicaid. It was easier to get help if you had private insurance. So we left our most vulnerable people often without the services they needed. I hope that HB 402 will find a middle ground and help people get access to treatment. You know, I think my most important role in that as a lawmaker will be that oversight role to really monitor who is getting services and who is going to prison. We must make sure that we have not created a new pipeline to prison and that the, the people of color and economically disadvantaged people have access to treatment and to deflection as part of the new law. Thank you, Sarah. And now Mike, same question to you on Measure 110. Thank you. I, I can't uh, disagree with Sarah at all. Um, I, you know, I have philosophically always believed that drug addiction is a medical problem. It's not it's not a law enforcement problem and treating it as a law enforcement problem has created a bigger problem, which uh, partly, you know, incarcerate the, the, the large number of incarcerated people in, in the nation in Oregon is part of that 
part of the result of this uh, treating drug addiction as as a as a criminal, not a medical issue. Um, I certainly I supported Measure Ten, voted for it, and campaigned for it. And uh, and and uh, unfortunately, what we saw was the state was not prepared to gear up the uh, services that were needed, the treatment facilities, and and the personnel. And th this is you know part of what I've kind of harped on here that we are not providing services that are needed in the state. And to be, to be able to provide those services, we have to have a tax system that will actually provide the, the resources that we can provide services to the state. Um, I, you know, I, I'm certainly looking forward to the state uh, developing those resources necessary to treat problems of addiction and, and drug abuse, um, and not as a criminal problem, but as, as a medical problem. Thank you, candidates. Thank you so much, Sarah Finger McDonald, Mike Pilestein, for joining in a lively discussion. And to all watching, thank you so much on behalf of the League of Women Voters of Corvallis and the Lynn Benton branch of the NAACP. And before we adjourn, I want to take just another two minutes for each candidate to tell you all why you should vote for them. We will start with Sarah and then move to Mike. Sarah, sure. your final thoughts. Thank you so much for to both the League of Women Voters and the NAACP for holding this forum and giving us an opportunity to talk. Um, I sit at a dinner table with my kids who are now teenagers and who don't shy away from voicing their frustration about decisions that have been made that put band-aids on problems that don't result in long-term solutions. A lot of what drives me in working for our community is really that conversation I had with my son, that I will work hard to make things better. For my kids, for all of our kids, I will work hard for long-term solutions to gun violence and education and housing and healthcare and to the environmental challenges that we face so that our communities that we're building now don't just support our families of today, but our kids' families so that they have opportunities that they that they need to grow and to thrive too. I'm Sarah Finger McDonald. I want to represent District 16 in the Oregon House so I can continue to work hard to make things better and build vibrant, equitable, and safe communities for Oregonians. To learn more, you can go to sarahfingermcdonald.com and please vote for me on November by, by November 5th. Thank you, Sarah. And Mike, final thoughts. Yeah, thank you. I, I, I have had 25 years of public service and public involvement in, in Corvallis. I've served on the city council for 12 years and I, I came into the city council as part of the living wage campaign of job with jobs with justice, which uh, resulted in a living wage ordinance in Corvallis that protects low income workers that hired by the city. It prevents the city from kind of lowballing and and hiring people to work who are not uh, not covered by the city union's contracts. I I've served on the board of the Corvallis Environmental Center, the Pastoral Counseling Center, the the uh, United Campus Ministry at OSU at Westminster House. Um, I was I was chair of Mid, of Mid Valley Healthcare Advocates for several years. So I've I've put my time in. I've I've demonstrated that I'm effective effective leadership in the community. And and I, I what I'm advocating for now is is a visionary leadership of where the state is going. And I think on the issues of climate change, on health care, on education, on housing, uh, and, and, and the unhoused population, we need this visionary leadership. We need a, a, a different approach and a stronger approach and, and a commitment to having uh, governments at, at the state, county, and, and local level school boards that actually are able to provide the services that people demand and that we are not we have not been getting that so far from our legislature and and so i want to be there to instill those values the values of of nonviolence uh democracy 
um, and others that the, <laughs> the the other values of the Pacific Green Party. So, thank you for your time and and vote for me if if you want to see a, a new new type of leadership in the legislature. Wonderful. Thank you, candidates. And again, on behalf of the Lynn Benton branch of the NAACP and the League of Women Voters of Corvallis, thank you for all for listening as well out there in the internet world. And please talk to your friends, your neighbors, your family about their voting plans. Make sure that you get out, you vote, you vote early, and we'll see you all uh, uh, in November at the general election. Thank you so much and have a good night.